Hi. Well, it's terrific to be here and uh, at the home of ISU. I am a uh, ISU alum. This is my group back in Toulouse, France. It's not quite uh, Florida. Um, but it, ISU taught me the power of, of, of integrated groups from different disciplines to do powerful things, whether that's planning a mission to Mars or to reinventing the name of ISU to represent the height of our co-founders. And uh, it taught me many lessons that I applied in the world of medicine. And before I talk about the future of medicine, I'd like to speak a little bit about old school medicine. Where's medicine been in the past? Well, like this is an ISU reunion. I was recently back at a different reunion, um, back at the Mass General Hospital, where I did my residency in both internal medicine and pediatrics. And the MGH is a great old institution. It was now 200 years old. And this is more of a reunion of like war buddies, not, not like your classmates, because we've been through the trenches. This being Boston, we'd walk uphill both ways in the snow. And um, I found myself after one of the receptions there uh, at one of the famous spots in medical history. Um, this is the Bullfinch Building, and this is the famous Ether Dome, where in 1846, this lucky gentleman was the first patient to actually get general anesthesia with a surgery. Kind of a big deal if you're a patient. And the rumor that happened is a historic shrine, the Ether Dome. He did it with ether. Uh, hasn't changed. The room hasn't changed at all. It's, uh, it's uh, where we have some special meetings at MGH. And I, I wandered down the hall a few paces away, about two minutes away, to another historic spot at MGH where I'd spent my first month as a very green intern, uh, the Bigelow Service, and had a little bit of PTSD. And I noticed that that really hadn't changed either in uh, over a decade. Um, some of the same patients, some of the same nurses. Um, <laughs> Only difference was the poor intern, while they had to do an electronic medical record, had to print it out and also put it in a paper chart. So my thought was, even being at one of these great institutions like Mass General, um, that medicine hadn't changed in many ways. It's very siloed. We're still practicing healthcare medicine pretty much like we have for over 100 years. Uh, very much div divided by departments, very non-open source. Um, and it's being defined in old-fashioned ways that, that need to change if we're going to reinvent medicine. Because we're not a bucket of body parts, we're not all ologies in the medical profession. We can reinvent healthcare potentially in this new technological age, the space age, and, and change the way things are done. And we need to do that if we're going to address the exponential costs that are rising, the aging demographics, um, access to care. With Obamacare, we still today have 40 million Americans that are uncovered. How we do medicine differently at MGH than where I am back at Stanford, where I went to medical school and fellowship. How we don't use all this big data very efficiently and, and it's scattered information. And of course, all these technologies are very exciting. And just like in space, there's often very difficult adoption rates due to policy, law, and reimbursement. So, how might we think about changing healthcare? Well, one aspect is that we spend a lot of our money now on the, you know, 80% of our care on the 20% 20, 20 of patients with chronic disease, often in the last months of life. If we can start shifting that curve to the left to incentivize preventative care and using technology to keep us healthier, wouldn't that make more sense? If would we spend more money instead of in intensive care units, where it's thousands of dollars a day, let's shift it to the outpatient world, where it can be a dollar or two a day, and a lot of that can be enabled by new technologies. Now, in the last decade since I finished residency and came back to Stanford for fellowship, a lot of things have happened in the technology world. A lot of things are moving very, very quickly. We're really now in an exponential age. Many things are doubling every year in their, spice, uh, in their price and speed to performance ratio. And some of these can be a change to, to reinvent things. I think the theme today is open source. Many of the technologies here that are galloping along are developed by collaborative sharing and, and crowdsourced information. How have we invented and reimagined other fields? Well, we reinvented the way we read in the last few years, how we scrapbook, um, certainly how we take photos. Anyone remember Kodak? Um, we've uh, reinvented how we get news and even how we pay for things. How can we reimagine healthcare and medicine in that, in that framework? Well, one of it is through this new explosion, this new era of genomic medicine. Um, in terms of exponentials, the price and speed, uh, the price of a genome has dropped from about a billion dollars a decade ago to a little about $1,000 today. I just got my exome done for about $1,000. And in a couple of years, we'll probably have $100 genomes. How's that going to affect our ability to see within our own bodies, our inner space, and use that for good? Proteomics, all the proteins from your blood, those are also expanding in our abilities to measure those. We're using higher speed computing to re-image the body in space age ways. We can actually now sort of fly inside our brains and reconstruct um, at amazing detail our neuroanatomy, our pathways. We might be able to use that to understand disease better and do more personalized therapies. So the power of imaging is getting leveraged in healthcare by many of these fast-moving technologies. 
We can reimagine how we're going to treat heart disease. A spin out from Stanford is taking fast CT scans of the heart, sending them to the cloud, and analyzing the coronary artery. No longer will you need a groin, a needle up the groin, and a, a catheter in the coronary. You can measure with basically NASA-based microfluidic technology and, and, and uh, cal calculations what, what's going to happen in that, in that coronary vessel and will be improved with a catheter or a stent. So those things are reimagining and disrupting some of the ways we do healthcare. We may be combining technologies like focused ultrasound with real-time MRI to burn out tumors without any surgery whatsoever. Clearly, the phone in our pocket, which has about a billion times the price and speed performance of the best supercomputers of the 1970s, is really becoming a medical device. I started out with one of those StarTex on the left, and clearly today, the mobile phone technology is really a medical platform. These are in the hands of almost every physician today. I think about 70% of US physicians has an iPad, and all the medical students at Stanford get one their very first day of school. And there's 20 or 1,000 or more different medical apps that are being applied in very creative ways and are creating this new era of what is often called digital medicine. We have streams of information now, or data, that we have to challenge ourselves to make actually into useful information. The phones themselves are not just communication platforms, they're becoming um, diagnostic platforms themselves, using the camera to take pictures of the skin, maybe diagnose a mole or a lesion, elements that can look at your uh, ocular areas. Uh, I'll mention uh, one on my phone, actually, is can read my EKG in real time. So this is actually a cheap case that can measure my EKG and send it to the cloud and uh, potentially be analyzed by a cardiologist or be used by an ambulance driver or beyond. So many, many new innovations are coming upon these new platforms that can be used to change our way we do healthcare, just like uh, Bones McCoy here developed the tricorder, really actually entering the tricorder age where small, cheap devices can be used in smart ways. And there's actually a tricorder XPRIZE uh, that was just announced with over 150 teams working together to converge on technology to use it in smart new ways. Now, I talked about inner space. We're now able to record our own data in new ways, and there's proliferations of these cheap um, $100 type consumer devices, some that are be scales that can tweet your weight, which might be useful if you're trying to stay on a diet, to uh, watches that'll measure your heart rate, um, blood pressure cuffs connected to your smartphone. These are going to enable you know, many fields, including obviously aerospace. John Glenn may not need to fly with all this equipment uh, strapped on next time. Um, you know, when, when uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed on the moon, we could actually record uh, uh, Buzz Aldrin's uh, EKG in real time from the Earth. Well, we can now sort of do that today with our mobile phones and maybe make that useful in improving our health and medicine. Because the, the sensors themselves are becoming small and ubiquitous. We're moving from sort of sensors 1.0 to sensors 3.0, where they're going to become ubiquitous, cheap, and layer along lots of data, not just your vital signs, but when you open the fridge at 2 in the morning, or uh, how often did you brush your teeth. And we can make use of that in smart ways, whether that's a pacemaker, which are getting smaller and cheaper and easier to implement, and they have apps, so you can look at your heart rate on your phone, and obviously the hackers of the world might find that interesting. Um, that's also a challenge, though. This gentleman, Hugo, has a pacemaker, an implantable defibrillator, um, which records his heart, but the company that makes the defibrillator won't give him his own data. So how do we manage these sorts of new technologies and understand and leverage the data in smart ways? For us in the medical field, there's an explosion of data. How, is, how do we as clinicians make sense of this complexity of information that's growing exponentially to leverage that into smarter preventative and diagnostic and therapeutic decisions? Well, one element of that is artificial intelligence. You heard earlier today about Watson. And IBM is actually focusing now on applying IBM Watson to healthcare. I don't like to call it AI. I like to call it IA, intelligence augmentation. It's less threatening to the physician. But this can be used in powerful ways to help do better diagnostics, make better decisions uh, therapeutically. And I think you'll see AI implemented in healthcare, particularly to leverage these massive data sets that are coming along stream. And I think soon we'll have almost the equivalent of an OnStar. You have OnStar in your car, many of you, that tell you when something's wrong, the check engine light goes on. You'll have an OnStar for the body that will be a body sensor network that'll take signals from many places and say, when is your check, check engine light on? Or by, God forbid, when you've had a crash, you can call 911. So we'll leverage these in smart ways. Other technologies that are emerging is this world of participatory health, the way that we're connected now in new ways through elements like Facebook. And Facebook is actually used by this mother to diagnose her son. She sort of put it up there and crowdsourced the diagnosis, which is a rare diagnosis called Kawasaki's disease. We're using new imaging modalities like augmented reality to see yourself the way you want to be or how you're going to be if you don't stay on your diet. Um, we're now in the era of telerobotics or exoskeletons to enable the disabled, the paraplegic, to walk. So a lot is happening in medical technology. 
we actually not want, we don't really want to have exoskeletons. We want to have stem cell cures or other cures for spinal cord injury. And a lot's happening now in the world of regenerative therapy, combining new generations of stem cells, even with the world of, of 3D printing, where we can integrate stem cells, tissue engineering to build new personalized body parts, uh, and hopefully, eventually, replace cells with ink and 3D print complex organs. So, as we think about healthcare and these technologies. It doesn't really matter if you have a, the best new mousetrap in the box if no one's going to pay for it. As my friend Dean Arnish says, we don't practice evidence-based medicine, we practice reimbursement-based medicine. So we have to think about reimagining how we craft the system. And some of this can be done with some of the technologies that, again, weren't here a decade ago when I finished my residency training. Now, I've had an interesting purview on this field as the medicine track chair at Singularity University, which is based at NASA Ames in Mountain View, California. And we look at, we take people out of their silos and cross train in medicine, biotech, robotics, artificial intelligence. Um, it was co-founded by the ISU co-founder, Peter Diamandis and Ray, Ray Kurzweil. And each summer we bring together a lot of folks as well through executive programs to look at where technology can go and how can we leverage that. I actually founded a specific program based there called FutureMed, where we take physicians and others across spectrums and look at how we can reinvent medicine in new ways. Everyone gets to wear scrubs as well. So, um, the exciting thing now is that many new players are coming to healthcare. Just like there are many fields represented as audience, think about how your field can apply to health and medicine in new ways. Actually, many new people are bringing beginner's mind to healthcare. Data from the government is being opened up and shared in new ways. There are hackathons, there are new incubators, all leveraging health information and new ways to approach healthcare. Because we have a big problem with our budget, and it's not just our genetics, it's other information and other ways of rethinking things that's going to sort of get us out of this big hole. And one of that is design thinking. How we think about using actually design from other fields to interact with medicine. Well, if we wanted to get, let's say, from here back to San Francisco in a car, we wouldn't necessarily put wings on the car. We might actually build a new jet fighter or a 747 and actually build a whole system around that. Just like in space systems, it's not just any one technology, it's putting it all together. I've been lucky to be a pilot since college and um, actually learned to fly uh, when I was a freshman at Brown University. This is my first attempt. The takeoff was good, the landing wasn't so good. Um, and uh, later learned to fly in one of these. And when I was a resident at Mass General, joined the Air National Guard as a flight surgeon. So I was the doctor for the fighter pilots. I've been in the Guard for 10 years, first with an F-15 squadron and now with an F-16 squadron in California. And there's a lot of lessons to be learned from the aviation world and the space world that can apply, be applied to designing better healthcare systems. A few examples. Number one, obvious one, is checklists. They weren't really used until a few years ago. Sometimes the wrong leg would be cut off. You know, that's a big oops. Um, but applying checklists in the classroom is pioneered by Atul Gawande and others at Harvard and beyond. They've reduced the mortality and morbidity by over 30%, which is huge. Um, and we're using checklists and procedure manifests in new ways in healthcare. We're using the idea of simulation. We've expanded the number of people flying dramatically and safety has gone way up. You want your 747 captain to have practiced every engine out and bird strike. You also want your anesthesiologist to practice every possible problem as well. So, in a, for, so simulation is being used for medical students, to retraining, to learning new things, to even designing new drugs by simulating things ahead of time. How about the idea of heads-up display? And we've gone from the old-fashioned round dial cockpit to the glass cockpit. And so we can now push data to the pilot in this case in much smarter ways so they can see information more clearly. The heads-up display is different when you're in a dogfight or if you're landing and there's something called Bitching Betty that'll tell you you might be hitting a mountain. Altitude. Little cues can Altitude. help you in certain settings. So imagine how we can apply that in the healthcare sphere. Well, we're already in the era where you use sort of feedback loops and elements of heads-up heads up display in your car. You might uh, modulate your driving. You might have a health GPS in the future that helps you turn left to right in your healthcare course. Of course, you don't want too much information either. That can be a problem, right? Um, we're actually in the world now of soon to have maybe data transmitted right to our eyeballs. And maybe we'll, that'll be on contact lenses soon. But today, we're already in the era of Google Glass, where we can get data ported right to us. How might that be useful in healthcare? Well, it might be useful if you're an anesthesiologist, for example, looking at your patient vital information. It might be helpful if you're looking at your breakfast in the morning and you see it with new eyes, right? All right? And what if you get some warnings from up above, you know? Pull up, pull up. Yeah, like that, pull up, pull up. So, 
a radar is another sense. Think about our air traffic control system. You know where the other planes are going, where the thunderstorms are, who to avoid, uh, what, the, what is the experience of other pilots. Similarly now with cars, there's the ability to map, in this case, Rome, just by other drivers sharing where the traffic jams are, where are the cops, where are the roadblocks, all that sort of crowdsourced, open source data coming together to build a map of Rome in one day and let you know how the, the best way to get to the forum, for example. So, I think by integrating all these new fast moving technologies, we're going to move from an era of sort of flying blind, sort of empiric, one size fits all medicine, to a new era, integrating all these omics, crowdsourced data, hopefully open source data. We're going to share information like where's the latest flu in your neighborhood to make better decisions. And in the future, your social network might not just be used for friending, but might be also available to tell you which friend not to shake hands with that day, right? <laughs> all that's coming together in new ways. New dashboards, new ways to see information and make it actionable, enabling you as a patient and as a physician. So I think the future of medicine is bright if we reinvent and reimagine things, particularly by using new technologies and smart ways, using design thinking, lessons from other worlds like space and aviation, thinking about how we can hyper-connect each other and give ourselves warning and share our experiences. And ultimately, I hope the future of medicine is bright, particularly if we do things like citizen science, where you can do things like fold it to help Cure, help solve protein designs and new drug formation. Or in my world of oncology, where we can share information like your fully sequenced tumor and leverage multiple physicians and scientists from around the world to collaborate what might be the best therapy individualized for you. And I hope in the future, even though there are significant privacy concerns with healthcare, just like in Facebook, instead of just being an organ donor, you can become a data donor. And you can actually share your information, your experiences, your health pathways, your radar with others. So we can bring all these exciting fields together in smart new ways. And I think by doing that, we'll have a bright new future in medicine. So I'd encourage you to look for where the exponentials are, where they converge. And I think together we can redefine medicine in new ways. We can empower you as an individual and as a patient, empower the clinician to be smarter and better. And with this, we can fly higher, safer, faster, and live longer, healthier, effective lives. Thanks very much. And with that, And with that, I'll bring back our co-host, Chris, who's going to tell us about one new world premiere video to share with everyone here. Thanks.